I had three days between my two book signing events to see as much as I could of the Henry Knox Trail. With the help of my brother Charlie and his wife Paula, who had joined me in Ticonderoga, we found the first five markers on the first day. I continued to Albany on my own the second day. At a pretty fast pace, I reached Westfield the third day. Then I headed straight for Thomaston, Maine. Henry Knox's task was to transport the guns down the 32-mile length of Lake George. Then, with his 80 yoke of oxen pulling 40 wooden sleds, he dragged the guns south through New York and west over the Berkshires toward Cambridge. He would accomplish this incredible feat within eight weeks. According to the journal that he kept, Knox arrived at Fort Ticonderoga on the evening of December 5, 1775. He was accompanied by his 19-year-old brother William and a servant known as Miller. Henry was only 25 years old. 59 guns had been chosen to take to General Washington, a few from Crown Point Fort, the rest from Ticonderoga. That included 43 heavy brass and iron cannons, six cohorns, eight mortars, and two howitzers. They were dismounted from the old carriages, which were rotten and weak. They were removed from the fort walls and ready for transportation the following day. Marker 1 marks the point of departure from the fort. Marker 2 shows the road that they traveled to an area where they forded a creek to enter the town. And marker number 4 is where they launched the boats. You see marker number 1 the first thing when you take the key to the continent tour at the fort. It's right in the middle of the parade ground. Marker number two is a bit more of a challenge. You find it on the exit road leading out of the fort. There were three or four other memorial type markers along the way and I had to stop at each one to see if that was what I was looking for. Marker number three was relocated some years back and is clustered with some other war memorials. So that's the road coming from Fort Ticonderoga into town, which is that way. And just as you enter here to the left is this whole little triangle of monuments. And there is what we're looking for, marker number three. The plaque was on the shady side. I needed my flash to photograph the image. Knox wrote in his diary on December 6th, employed in getting the cannon from the fort on board a gondola in order to get them to the bridge. The bridge crossed La Chute, which is what the French named the creek that connected Lake George to Lake Champlain. As you pass through the town of Ticonderoga, you get a sense for the hill that the guns had to travel over from the bridge to the boat launch on Lake George. The Portage Road bypassed Mount Defiance from where you can see the fort. The road they followed is still called Portage Road. We are at marker four, which is by the Mossy Point boat launch site. Over here. Ta-da! Here's our marker. On December 8th, all the boats were ready to be placed on vessels to sail down the lake. The heaviest pieces were placed on a scow, which was a double-ended, flat-bottom, barge-like vessel used to transport bulk cargo. The boats departed the morning of December 9th. At 3 o'clock in the afternoon, with a lot of wind, the scow got caught on some rocks at Sabbath Day Point, located today by marker number 5. To get there by car, you have to retrace your steps back to Ticonderoga, then follow Route 9 on the west side of the lake down to Sabbath Day Point. We were following a guide put out by the Hudson River Valley Institute website. The instructions were fairly good, but in this case, all it said was that the marker was near the harbor. A local resident at the harbor pointed to the point. All right, this marker, number five, has been hard to find. First, we asked these guys. They sent us to a dock, which is down that way. 
then we found a really nice woman, I think her name was Pam. She told us that it was probably, well she and a neighbor told us it was probably back up here. So, hoping someone didn't come out here with a shotgun and kill me for trespassing. Came up this grassy area. This is my brother and Paula. And video and taping down here and lo and behold there it is so exciting needless to say because this marker was on private property or close to private property there were no wayfinding signs this is all you see from the street highway 9 and by the way that grace church is really cute you should stop to see it day two was a busy day I'd spent the night in Ticonderoga, so I had to pass marker number five at Sabbath Day Point to get to marker number six. At the really adorable town of Bolton Landing, it marks where Nock and his crew spent the night of December 10th. He wrote in his diary, we warmed ourselves sufficiently and took a comfortable nap, laying with our backs to the fire. I turned left at this corner and down a short drive to Rogers Memorial Park. The monument overlooks the Little Bay. It is the best taken care of monument I would see on the whole trip. I would really like to return to Bolton Landing and spend some time there. Knox wrote that after rising the next morning, we set out and in six hours and a quarter of excessive hard pushing against a fresh breeze, we reached Fort George. Fort George is at the southern end of Lake George. The marker is on the left-hand side of the road as you enter Fort George State Park. Henry reached Lake George midday, December 11th. The weather was a constant concern. He wanted to reach the end of the lake before they froze over, but once he transferred the guns to sleds, he needed snow on the roads. He would cross the Hudson four times, and he needed it to be frozen enough to withstand the weight of 2,000 pounds of guns. Markers 8 through 11.5 show the route the train of artillery followed to Fort Miller, where Henry Knox stayed with a Judge Dewar. Marker number 8 is on the side of the road of Route 9, just past the intersection with Bloody Pond Road. Marker number nine is on the northwest corner of Crandall Park in Glens Falls. Marker number 10 is in front of the public library in Hudson Falls. I went into the library and introduced myself to the librarian. She had no idea why there was a marker on the front lawn of her library. I filled her in and got an address and I'm going to send her a copy of my book, Henry's Big Kaboom. Marker number 11 is on the front lawn of the public high school of Fort Edward. I don't know why marker number 11.5 has such a funny number. It marks the place along the Hudson where Fort Miller used to be. If you turn right at this church, you'll immediately cross the river. The train of artillery continued to follow the Hudson River south. Marker 12 is in a turnout on the side of the road called Stark's Knob. The monument's a little hard to see here. There's a better picture. There's also a modern day sculpture of one of Henry's ox carts. The place is called Stark Knob after a later battle during the revolution when General John Stark of New Hampshire held the British back on this knob or hill. Marker number 13 is at the southern end of Schulerville. Henry Knox wrote that by the time he reached this town, which he called Saratoga, it was snowing exceedingly fast. He reported that eight miles down the road, they turned into Ensign's Tavern, where they spent the night. It was Christmas Eve. The marker is no longer there. Just south of Saratoga National Historical Park, where routes 32 and 4 converge, we get to marker number 15 at Bemis Heights. Knox lodged here on Christmas Day. There was two feet of new snow on the ground. 
Marker number 16 is in Stillwater, right across the street from the library. Again, I went in and introduced myself, got an address, and promised to send them a copy of my book. They were very knowledgeable about the marker for the Henry Knox Trail that was across the street from their library. Marker 17 is next to the post office in Mechanicville. Mechanicville has a population of about 5,100 people. It's 20 miles north of Albany with 100,000 people. Albany is where it is because it's at the confluence of the Mohawk and Hudson Rivers. Knox first tried the Waterford Crossing, which was the normal crossing, but found that the ice was too thin. One of the carts fell in the water and he lost it forever. The rest of the train of artillery crossed the Mohawk at today's Crescent. Marker number 18 marks Waterford where the normal crossing would have been. Marker number 19 is on the west side of Luden Road, which is Route 9, in front of a stone slab company. Continuing on Old Luden Road, still Highway 9, you reach marker number 20 in Latham, in front of a Masonic Temple and Methodist Church. Still on that road, you get to downtown Albany, where the bridge crosses the Hudson River. Marker number 21 is across the street from the Albany Hospital. The train of artillery passed through here the first week of January. There used to be a marker 22 right at the entrance to the bridge crossing the Hudson. That's the second marker that has gone missing. While crossing on January 7th, one of the cannon fell through the ice. But on January 8th, Knox wrote, We went on the ice about 8 o'clock in the morning and proceeded so carefully that before night we got over 23 sleds and were so lucky as to get the cannon out of the river, owing to the assistance of the good people of the city of Albany. Following Route 20 over the Hudson, it continues southeast. Marker 23 marks the route. It's the least well-kept marker I saw during the trip. I'm willing to bet that none of its neighbors know why it's there. I reached Rensselaer at about 5 o'clock and I was pooped after all this treasure hunting, so I found a colonial inn up the street and spent the night. Starting with marker number 24 in East Greenbush, New York, I continued southeast crossed the border into Massachusetts, and continued on to Westfield. The countryside, as I crossed over the Berkshires, was absolutely beautiful. Marker number 24 is on the corner of Route 20 and Hayes Road in East Greenbush. It stands in front of a Methodist church. Marker 25 is a lonely little guy. It stands at the road divide between Route 9 and Route 20. Staying on Route 9, you find Marker 26 in Kinderhook, right in the town square. Kinderhook is a charming village, too. Thank goodness my GPS was working when I negotiated the road from Kinderhook past Ghent and across the Massachusetts border. The scenery was beautiful and interesting. A mile or two from Ghent stands Marker number 27 on the corner of a private home in what seems like the middle of the country. Driving down more beautiful road, you reach the corner of Taconic State Parkway and Harlemville Road, where you find marker number 28. Traveling along Route 22, you get to a place where it splits, where Route 22 goes to the left and 71, heading into Massachusetts, goes to the right. And that's where you see marker number 29. Shortly after that, you reach the border of New York State and Massachusetts. There's a boundary stake with New York stamped on one side and Mass stamped on the other. But the best part is the trail marker. On one side is New York marker number 30 with the New York design. And if you go to the other side, you see the new Massachusetts design for Massachusetts marker number one. Only a few miles later, you reach North Egremont Village home of Massachusetts marker number two. It's right in front of the North Egremont Village Country Store. The people here are very proud of their monument. They've combined it with another monument commemorating all people who have died for this country, including 9-11 victims. The post office is part of the general store. The building to the right was a tavern where Knox stayed on his way through town. 
Massachusetts marker 3 is in Great Barrington, which is a little bit bigger town. You don't see the marker until you're leaving town at the western end. Traveling through the Berkshires, Knox had some very steep mountains to climb. You can tell people in this area are proud of their heritage. Monterey, nestled in the hills, is home to Massachusetts marker number four. Someone named a gallery after Knox, and when I stepped into the library, the librarians were very excited that they would be receiving a copy of Henry's Big Kaboom. Finding marker Massachusetts 5 in Otis, however, was a completely different story. It almost stumped me. It was hiding in the bushes. I passed it the first time without even seeing it. In case you're looking for it, watch for this farmhouse on the right. It's right across the street. To get to Massachusetts marker number six, you pass through Blanford, and then you turn right on General Knox Road. The marker is on the right, just a short way up the hill. General Knox Road is pretty hilly and windy. It's hard to imagine the oxen having to deal with this in the snow. The last marker I was able to see before dashing to Maine was marker number seven in Westfield. At this point, the road is coming out of the Berkshires and back onto flatter land. You drive into the center of town, turn right at the square, and there's the marker standing by the side of the road. I have 20 more monuments to see in the state of Massachusetts. The last one is in the Commons in Cambridge. So I will do that when I return to New England in September to be continued. As to this trip, my next stop was the Henry Knox Museum in Thomaston, Maine. The weekend event was titled Boom, and my Henry's Big Kaboom book was one of the featured events.